Hi everyone, I'm Hess. I'm a cardio reg at York and I'm currently trying to get used to the sound of my own voice on these recordings um, but what I'm going to try and do is provide some good cardiology electronic teaching that should be applicable for both phases two and three of your HIMSS course. I'm sure you've been at HIMSS for long enough already to have um, read several of these uh, long lists of slightly wordy outcomes. I'm not going to read them all out for you. Um, I've underlined a few that I think are going to be particularly pertinent to what we're talking about today. You can pause the video, video now and um, have a read through for yourself if you want. Uh, we'll refresh them at the end again. For all your teaching to be really clinically applicable. Uh, so I'm going to try and deliver this through a series of case presentations initially. So we'll start by imagining that we're seeing a patient on the acute medical unit or somewhere where you're clerking a patient initially in the hospital. And the chap we're going to see is a 56 year old man who has presented with central chest pain. Take your presenting history with a Socrates type pain approach. So this chap tells you that he's had central crushing heavy chest pain. It started suddenly at rest, was severe. He rates it at 8 out of 10 in severity. It lasted for about half an hour. There weren't any particular relieving factors. It didn't radiate anywhere, but he did notice that he was clammy and sweaty at the time. You ask him about his background. He used to smoke about 20 cigarettes a day for about 20 years, but he stopped 10 years ago. He also takes medication from his GP for high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes, but is otherwise pretty fit and well for age. He tells you that both his dad and his elder brother have had heart attacks. Both of these were in their 60s when this occurred. He's an IT technician who lives with his wife and has two grown-up sons who aren't at home anymore. He also tells you that he plays golf regularly, but otherwise doesn't get much exercise. He takes metformin and amlodipine prescribed by his GP, but tells you that he doesn't buy any medications over the counter and also that he hasn't used any illicit drugs in the past. And we're good hymn students, so we don't forget to ask how he feels about it. This particular patient tells you that he's frightened. He's worried that it's his heart. Um, he thinks his dad and his brother had similar symptoms when they had their heart attacks. Try to stop and think at this point what the different things that could potentially be going on would be and maybe what sort of investigations you'd like to try and direct your differentials. Talk a bit now about um, the patient pathway of how you actually come to see this patient. I think when I was third year, I, I didn't really have a clear idea of um, exactly how this worked and it is, in particularly in cardiology, particularly crucial as to where we direct patients and what happens from their initial symptoms. So after this chap had had pain for about 10 minutes, his wife calls an ambulance. This, uh, not to be too gender stereotypical, but um, this is actually what we see quite frequently. It's often the wife that um, says, actually, no, I think you need medical attention. Um, so we say his wife calls the ambulance. Medics arrive at their home. And the first thing they're going to do after some basic observations is to perform an ECG if someone is having chest pain. 
This is a section of the patient's ECG. I talk about ECG interpretation in a different series of talks, um, but for the purposes of just now, what we say is that this is a normal ECG with no concerning features. Had this ECG showed ST elevation, a different pathway would now be started that we'll talk about in the future. But as this ECG shows no concerning feature, the paramedics would now transport the patient to the local accident and emergency department. In ED, the patient is going to be seen by a doctor, have a history taken, an examination performed, and they will have further ECGs performed and laboratory tests will be taken, as well as their basic observations. Patient's examination is unremarkable. In two hours, their blood results, their cardiac enzymes, specifically troponin, comes back and it's raised with a value of 679 which is a very significantly po positive result. Repeat ECG shows no dynamic change. It's still a nice, normal sinus rhythm. What is likely to happen is the ED staff are going to want to get the patient out of there as soon as possible for bed space. So they're going to pen the patient to admit to medicine and likely at some point the patient will then be referred on to the cardiology team. And we've got a clear history from the patient. We know that we've got a normal ECG, but we have a unequivocally positive troponin. So at this point, stop and try and think about how these new bits of information might change what you think is going on, what's at the top of your differentials, and what else might also be happening. What could the alternative explanations be? Point. I'd pull my clinical reasoning together with a number of key factors. This patient has what we describe in the business as a good history. And by that, what we mean is a good history for a ischemic heart disease type pain. So the pain is central, it's crushing or heavy, it's severe, it came on suddenly and is associated with symptoms such as feeling clammy, feeling sweaty. So all of these factors together do make you highly suspicious that this could be a ischemic uh, cardiac pain. The patient also has a number of risk factors relevant to ischemic heart disease. He's got a family history of ischemic heart disease, he's a hypertensive, he's a diabetic, and he's also had quite a significant smoking history in the past. So these things, again, all together, do start to point us in the direction that this could be cardiac ischemia. Got a normal ECG though. Does this mean that this couldn't be ischemic heart disease? It doesn't. All that this tells me is that he doesn't need to have primary PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, um, which is our fancy way of saying emergency intervention. Um, it does not exclude that this could be ischemic heart disease, uh, acute coronary syndrome, or um, a myocardial infarction. The other thing we know at this point is that the patient has a unequivocally positive troponin cardiac enzyme. Now, a lot of people at this point will turn to the patient and tell them that they've had a heart attack, they've had a myocardial infarction. This 
isn't technically correct. All that the positive biomarkers tell us is that there has been, to some degree, damage to the heart muscle. But the mechanism of that damage, we are cannot be entirely certain of at this point. So with this information, what are the top of your differentials and what else could be happening? take our clinical reasoning further. One of the things that we can say for definite right now is that there has been an area of heart muscle damage because we know we have a troponin leak. For definite at this point, but we can start to think about what the likely mechanisms of this heart muscle damage are could have been a loss of blood supply to an area of the heart muscle. So this is what we mean with ischemic heart disease or a myocardial infarction. But there are other possibilities. A large pulmonary embolism will cause strain to the right side of the heart and therefore can lead to heart muscle damage and therefore a troponin leak. And we certainly at this point haven't excluded that sort of mechanism in this chap. Inflammation of the heart muscle, such as in pericarditis or myocarditis, will also lead to heart muscle damage and therefore a troponin leak. Where we use our history, our examination, all our findings so far to try and put together our list of differentials as to what fits the best, what's the most likely. And we know in this chap that his history fits and his risk factors fit with this being a myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease. So this probably is at the top of our differentials at this point. It's not impossible that the patient has a large pulmonary embolism, but we'd probably expect shortness of breath to be a more predominant feature in the history, and we'd expect the pain to be more pleuritic, so a sharp pain on deep inspiration. Myocarditic pain often is positional in nature, again can be pleuritic, and we often do see a typical ECG change um, with these patients. Other mechanisms of heart muscle damage, so a troponin rise in association with chest pain. The significant hemodynamic strain will also put strain on the heart. So a severe sepsis, blood loss, burns, aortic dissection, all of these can lead to heart strain and therefore chest pain and troponin rise. Very fast heart rates, arrhythmias such as fast AF or VT, VF, can cause strain to the heart muscle and therefore troponin rise and chest pain. Strain within the heart such as aortic stenosis or the obstruction you see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can also lead to a troponin rise and aortic stenosis is also known to be associated with chest pain. A condition called Takasubu's cardiomyopathy in which classically there is a stressful situation that leads to a ballooning of the apex of the heart. Uh, this can cause both significant troponin rises and present with chest pain. Trauma to the heart will cause a troponin leak, so a head-on car collision. Um, you'd probably know this by the history, um, but also 
somebody that's a week out from bypass surgery or valve surgery who presents with chest pain, which might not be that surprising if they've just had a midline thoracotomy, um, they will have a baseline troponin raised at that point. It's worth noting at this point that a myocardial infarction, a troponin rise that has occurred secondary to a, another process going on in the body such as a significant sepsis, we tend to term a type 2 myocardial infarction. In these cases, usually there will be something in the history that's pointing to a secondary process. You're also like to ha likely to have other abnormalities in observations, in blood results, such as in the case of a sepsis, you'd see a high white cell count, neutrophil count, um, pyrexial, and maybe an abnormal chest x-ray that are all going to point to there being another process going on. In the case of the chap that we're talking about here, uh, none of those things are present, which points more to it being a primary cardiac event. Our patient hasn't reported any palpitations and we haven't noticed any abnormal rates, arrhythmias on his ECG which makes a arrhythmia a less likely cause of his presentation. Hopefully someone would note a significant ejection systolic murmur in the case of aortic stenosis when they were examining the patient. It can often be quite difficult to exclude a Takasubu's cardiomyopathy um, with these type of presentations, it is now reported to be more common than we originally thought, but often there is a history that someone has had a recent stressful life event. We'd know from our history if the patient had recently had significant trauma to their heart. By this point, we're all agreed that the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms is the sudden loss of blood supply to an area of the heart muscle, so ischemic heart disease. The patient's history fits with a acute coronary syndrome, such as a myocardial infarction. And he has positive biomarkers, so we know that there has been an area of the heart muscle that has been subjected to a degree of damage. Even if we're fairly confident that this chap is presenting with a ischemic hit to part of his heart muscle, we can still think about the different possible mechanisms of that ischemic hit, of that loss of blood supply to the heart muscle. And there are a few possibilities. The mechanism most commonly thought about is the classical ischemic heart disease, atheromatous plaque with then potentially a clot thrombus formation on top of the underlying diseased coronary arteries. It is possible, however, to reduce the blood supply to an area of heart muscle significantly simply through a coronary artery spasm. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection is another method by which you can get an ischemic hit to an area of the heart supplied by a particular coronary artery which is affected. Our chap's risk factors and how common ischemic heart disease is, the most likely cause here is a underlying plaque coronary artery disease. 
Um, but this is something that we certainly cannot say for definite at this point. So just to summarise, because we love a good summary at HIMSS, we've got a 56 year old chap who has a good history for a acute coronary syndrome. He has risk factors for ischemic heart disease. He has a normal ECG but this only excludes a STEMI and therefore the need for primary PCI. This does not exclude a NSTEMI as a diagnosis. He has positive cardiac specific biomarkers. So we know there has been a degree of damage to the heart muscle. Top of our list of differentials would be a acute coronary syndrome, likely a acute myocardial infarction. Likely mechanism for a infarcted area of heart muscle would be underlying atheromatous coronary artery disease with an acute plaque rupture. However, Without further invasive tests, we cannot be certain of the diagnosis or mechanism, so we need to remain vigilant for other possible explanations of the patient's symptoms, such as pulmonary embolism, coronary spasm, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or a Takasubu's cardiomyopathy. So our clinical suspicion is that our patient has acutely blocked a coronary artery leading to a degree of heart muscle ischemia. So what do we do now? The first thing we're going to do is to put our patient onto medical therapy. So dual antiplatelet treatment, so probably in this case that would be tacagrelor and aspirin, and in York, we'd also add in Fondaparanax, so a low molecular weight heparin. The idea of this is to break down any acute clot that has developed. Then we want to ensure to check that our clinical suspicion is right. So the patient will be listed for a angiogram. This allows us to visualise the coronary arteries and see whether indeed there is any flow limiting blockage there. The type of angiogram we'd list this patient for is what we term a query proceed. So this means that if there is anything found at the time that we can treat, we will continue, we will proceed to perform that intervention at the time, be that e extracting any clot or putting a stent into the lesion. The aim of this is to restore blood flow to the area of heart muscle. In the case of a NSTEMI, a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, the occlusion is incomplete so there will still be some blood flow so we have a reasonable time window to try and open up that coronary artery. In the case of a ST elevation MI, a STEMI, that would hopefully be diagnosed immediately as soon as the paramedics have gone out to the patient, we want to restore blood flow as soon as possible, certainly within 12 hours, because this indicates a complete occlusion of the coronary artery. So our patient with a suspected NSTEMI would have been initially treated with dual antiplatelet therapy and a anticoagulant such as Fondaparanax. 
He would then have a coronary angiogram query proceed as an inpatient and if a culprit lesion was found and it was treatable at the time, a drug eluting stent would be placed in that region. The patient would also be commenced on secondary prevention medical therapy, so a beta blocker such as bisoprolol, a ACE inhibitor such as ramipril, and a statin such as atorvastatin. We would also likely perform as an inpatient, if services allowed, a echocardiogram to assess how the heart muscle itself is functioning. This can also allow us to look and see if there are any particular regions of the heart wall that are showing a motion abnormality that could link to the area of which there's been an impaired blood flow. Summary, our patient was a 56-year-old man presenting with a central crushing chest pain that was severe in nature, lasted for approximately 30 minutes and was associated with him feeling clammy and sweaty. He had a number of risk factors for ischemic heart disease, including being an ex-smoker, a hypertensive and a type 2 diabetic. He also had a family history of ischemic heart disease. And after our history, examination and finding a positive troponin alongside a normal ECG, the top of our differentials would be a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Without further investigation, however, we would not be able to be certain of this diagnosis, so we would bear in mind differentials such as a pulmonary embolism, coronary artery spasm, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or Takasubu's cardiomyopathy. An echocardiogram was performed showing normal left ventricular function, but a possible regional wall motion abnormality of the lateral wall of the heart. Diagnosis of NSTEMI was confirmed on coronary angiogram when a 80% circumflex artery stenosis was found. A drug eluting stent was inserted into the lesion in the circumflex artery. And would then have been discharged home on dual antiplatelet therapy and secondary prevention and would be likely to be seen in nurse-led follow-up after having input from a multidisciplinary team including cardiac rehabilitation nurses. So that completes our first case history when thinking about central chest pain. Um, here's a reminder of learning outcomes surrounding central chest pain and we'll go through several more examples of presentations with central chest pain to try and really cover in depth all of these outcomes and the differences between the different presentations.